Hello, my name is Claire Ford and I'm the Manager of Population Development and Welfare at Tronga Conservation Society Australia. So molecular genetics is a really valuable addition to our conservation management toolbox, particularly as it is becoming increasingly accessible and the application of these newer technologies are becoming better understood. Today, I'm going to share with you a case study of two extinct in the wild species, the Christmas Island blue tail skink and the Lister's gecko. So this is a conservation program that is led by Parks Australia and Tronga is very proud to partner with Parks Australia and to collaborate on conservation breeding, husbandry, genetic management, as well as disease investigation. So a bit about Christmas Island. Christmas Island is an Australian territory. It's located 1,500 kilometres from the mainland and only 350 kilometres from Java in Indonesia. It's an isolated seamount of volcanic origin and it emerges from the depths of the Indian Ocean. There is around 80 kilometres of coastline, which is mostly made up of sea cliffs. The climate is tropical, it's equatorial, and Christmas Island gets around two metres of rain each year, and there's a very distinct wet and dry season. Approximately two thirds of the island is National Park, which is managed by Parks Australia. There's a very unique forest structure, unlike anywhere else in the world, due to the presence of around 180 million red crabs. This is the, key spe um, the keystone species which drives the ecosystem. So we know islands are prone to extinction, particularly with human-assisted colonisation of islands by new invasive species, and Christmas Island certainly hasn't escaped this phenomenon. Four of the five mammal species are now considered extinct, Six of the native reptile species, five of which endemic, four have now entirely disappeared from the wild. But there is some good news though, because two of these species at least, the Christmas Island blue tail skink and the Lister's gecko, although extinct in the wild, continue to persist in the conservation breeding program, which is based at Christmas Island and at Tronga Zoo in Sydney. So the Christmas Island blue tail Blue tail skinks historically were very common across the island. They were even described as hyperabundant. They're a generalist species that tend to thrive in a range of habitats. They're very active, they're diurnal, and they have these beautiful flamboyant bright blue tails. The Lister's gecko were also considered common historically, although they were observed less frequently, perhaps in part because they're cryptic, they're nocturnal, and the preferred dense primary rainforest habitat. So since the 1990s, there's been really significant decline in these two lizard species. And this is aligned with the arrival of the invasive wolf, sm wolf snake. So the wolf snake's um, expansion has followed the pattern of decline of these two species. Consequently, we consider wolf snake as the key threatening process, but there are other factors in play as well, such as the invasive giant centipedes, habitat loss, and yellow crazy ants. So by 2012, the blue tail skink and the Lister's gecko could no longer be found in the wild. But before the species was totally lost, 66 blue tail geckos, geckos, 66 blue tail skinks, sorry, and 43 Lister's gecko were captured in 2009 and 2010 by the Parks Australia staff. And a, and a conservation program was established with the aim to secure the species from extinction. So Parks Australia funded the establishment of a facility on Christmas Island, as well as, well as setting up a secondary facility at Tronga Zoo. So the initial phase of the conservation breeding program focused upon developing husbandry, husbandry expertise and ensuring that both species could be successfully cared for and bred. The species had never been cared for in captivity before, so there was much to be learned around sexing techniques, understanding sex determination mechanisms, their social structure, capacity for sperm retention and so forth. Genetic management strategies were employed. The maximum avoidance of inbreeding strategy was implemented at both Christmas Island and at Tronga Zoo for blue tail skinks. This is a more or less a low intensive genetic management strategy that involves multi-male and multi-female groups, and then there's rotational exchanges between these groups. 
The idea is essentially to delay in breeding while maximising your effective population size. This scheme was also used on Ireland for the Listers gecko, whilst Tronga, while we're managing our Listers skink through a more intensive pairwise minimisation of kinship strategy. This could be done at Tronga because the, the species can be sexed more easily and we can successfully pairwise breed. We also have much more capacity at Tronga, and so this seemed to be a more effective strategy for us. So over the next 10 years, the 43 listers geckos and the 65 blue tail skinks expanded to populations of well over a thousand individuals for each species. So this allowed the program to expand into other areas. This included the trial release of both species into two predator controlled fence sites, as well as the assisted colonization of the blue tail skinks to two cocos keeling islands. So the fence sites have met with mixed success while the cocos releases have been very successful. There has been one significant challenge with this program, and that was the discovery of a novel endocrocus disease. Now, this was found in the Christmas Island breeding population in Mrs. Gecko in 2014, and subsequently in the blue tail skink population. So the disease is associated with massive swelling around the soft tissues of the head, which then disseminates through the organ system and it does cause substantial mortality in both species. This disease is also prevalent in the wild invasive geckos, and so careful biosecurity measures are employed to manage the disease risk. So when the Threatened Species Initiative put a call out for threatened species that might benefit from genomics or molecular genetics, our team were really quite excited as we had a number of questions that we thought could be answered um, through, <clears throat> through the molecular genetics. We wanted to understand what the genetic structure of both the populations on Christmas Island looks like and what the genetic structure of the, uh, of the animals that, from the Tronga facility look like. This species is now extinct in the wild and it crashed very suddenly. So we wanted to know and better understand, are we managing a genetically diverse population or is accumulated inbreeding come into play? We also wanted to understand, are the Tronga and the Christmas Island populations genetically indistinct? Because that will help inform our future management strategy. We had structured the program should they would be, but we wanted to better understand if that has indeed been effective. Overall, we wanted to know whether we had a lot of diversity to play with and whether we needed to intensify or reduce our management level. We also wanted to have some insights into the better into the chance of success and what the chances of future adaptability look like for these species. We wanted to know how our different management strategies have performed, the mean kinship strategy versus the maximum avoidance of inbreeding strategy. We know that mean kinship generally performs better than MAI, but we also know that larger populations perform better than smaller populations. Intensive breeding is an expensive business, so we wanted to know how do we get best bang for our conservation buck. For the Cocos Island populations, we've done translocations that involved both Tronga animals and Christmas Island bred animals. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that both those genetic lines were persisting in the descendant population, and if not, that would trigger investigation. And then finally, we're wanting to establish some baseline metrics across our populations now, and particularly for those released populations and cocos. So that can help in, inform our future management decision, such as when do we need to supplement? So we we're very grateful to receive the support of the Threatened Species Initiative, which facilitated a high quality reference genome for both species being generated. It revealed that both species are highly genetic diverse and it inferred that historically they both had really large population sizes, which is aligned with those historical observations. So uh, one, interesting, one interesting thing to note for the blue tail skink was 10% of the skink reference genome falls within long runs of homozygosity, including the site of the functional immune genes. So this could infer recent inbreeding or related nervous founders and it could potentially have fitness consequences long-term for the skink, and we might benefit from further investigation. 
the, in the gecko, we could only detect a single run of um, homozygosity, which is a very positive finding. Considering the disease risks associated with the enterococcus, this information is very relevant for us. So with the blue tail skink, we were also able to identify the sex chromosome, and this opens up the potential for us to be able to determine the sex of the offspring earlier than we can phenotypically sex animals. So overall, the genome permits us to infer historical demography, such as population size, allows us to have some insights into the genetic profile, disease susceptibility, future adaptive potential of the population, and more information um, along the lines through the functional gene diversity, such as those immune, immune genes or behavior genes. Um, so this is all really useful context to have when forward planning and the genome paper has just been published. We also carried out a SNP analysis of, so for some molecular genetics, and that involved DNA extraction from toe clips. And again, this revealed that both the blue tail skink and the Lister's geckos have been really well managed and have high levels gen of genetic diversity. We also found that the early program animals are very well represented in the current descendant population. Mm -hmm. We also do, were able to determine that both populations are genetically distinct, the Christmas Island population and the Tronga population. And we've also discovered the descendant populations on Copus that were seeded by animals from both Christmas Island and Tr Tronga Zoo. They represent both the Christmas and the Tronga lines, suggesting that both cohorts are surviving, breeding and contributing to the descendant population, which is great news for us. So how we use the genetic data and how has it been used to inform management for these species? Well, we now have a really high degree of confidence that we have genetically diverse populations. We're really confident that our management strategies are effective for gene diversity retention. The runs of homozygosity affecting the immune genes for the blue tail skink may have potential disease implications, which we could investigate further. We could investigate molecular sexing of skinks if that becomes more of an issue for us. And now we have some baseline data and with ongoing molecular genetic assessments that can assist with our future management decisions, such as when to, um, when to supplement our populations. We also know that the Taronga population and the Christmas Island populations are different, and then we can tailor our management strategy accordingly. We're also observing that the Lister's gecko on Christmas Island is, um, has quite a lot of diversity and that has been quite an effective strategy with the larger population size. Now we did experience some limitations with molecular genetics. The founder cloaked toe clips DNA were mostly too degraded. So we couldn't really compare the founders of those animals that originally came in from Christmas Island to the descendants population. So we had to infer how effective our, our management strategies have been through sampling the older, older samples possible and the current younger samples possible. It, and this really highlights the importance of uh, sample storage for us. The DNA degradation was a really significant issue. We sent away something like 500 blue tail skink samples, but only a couple of hundred of those actually had some DNA that could be successfully extracted. In terms of what does the future hold, there's still lots more work to be done. We'd really like to continue with some ongoing molecular genetics check-ins on the Cocos Keeling Islands to see how the genetic profile of the lizards have changed over time. We'd also like to investigate our captive groups our in our conservation breeding program to determine if a few individuals are dominating the breeding opportunities in the breeding tanks or if those breeding opportunities are being reasonably shared. So that's going to help determine how effective our group management strategies are. And another area is eDNA. Uh, we'd really like to be able to utilise eDNA for detection of the invasive uh, predator wolf snakes and use that to be able to detect the wolf snakes within the fence sites uh, so that we know that they're predator controlled. So that's pretty much it from me. I'm going to leave you with some references that you might be interested in. I have highlighted the genome paper, which has just come out recently. Thank you very much. And uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.